So today we continue our discussion on the parallels between the Damodar Leela and the pastimes of of the, the, the narrative of the Bhagavad Gita. A quick recap of what was discussed till now. Yesterday, I discussed broadly the principle of how love underlies and unifies everything, the Tattva and the Leela. So the, the Bhagavad Gita is more of Tattva philosophy and the Gita and the, and the Damodar Leela is itself a Leela. In terms of the narrative, both begin with a, a position of subordination. That the Lord is subordinate to his devotee. And then the Lord, Allah, he is Arjuna's charioteer and he is Yashoda's child. And then during the course, what he does is, while Yashoda is doing her own thing, thinking, saying, I have disciplined Krishna. During that time, what is happening is Krishna is pursuing his plan. He lets himself be caught, but where? Near the grinding water and near the Yamala Arjun trees. And similarly, Krishna, Arjuna is asking Krishna to get the chariot in the middle. But at that time, Krishna gets it right in front of Bhishma and Drona. So that Arjuna will feel the deepest level of confusion and will feel the need for wisdom which Krishna will provide through the Bhagavad Gita. And then, this is Mother Ishwara, I'm trying to tie Krishna, feels overwhelmed, confused, and then eventually becomes appreciative. And her, her ropes are not able to tie Krishna. Similarly, what happens in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is trying to make sense of what he's seeing. A huge form. Nantam na madhyam na punastavadim. So he's, uh, initially it's awesome for him. But then after that it becomes scary, awful for him. And then he asks, what is this? This is the Kala Rupa. So although Krishna does not show anything scary to Mother Yashoda, but still the idea is this, from his Madhurya, from the subordinate position, he has manifested the Aishwarya. So today we will move forward in both the narrative of the Gita and the narrative of the Damodar Leela. In the Damodar Leela, towards the end, that in one sense, the Leela has two endings. So at one level, Ishwada ties Krishna and she has in one sense disciplined Krishna. So many times when we in today's world try to look back at what was what what was happening in the past, what were people doing in the past, we have to put aside our filters in order to understand things. Mm. I was talking about this Damodar Leela in America a few months ago and there was one Western lady in the audience and as I was describing the devotee, the past life was so sweet and enchanting, the devotees were ecstatic. But I could see this, this woman was just getting more and more agitated. And then finally I told her about how she might succeed in tying Krishna. And she just got up. Are all you people crazy? She says, this is child abuse. Are you enjoying it all? What kind of perverts are you? <laughs> So, for her, the idea of tying a child, it's child abuse. <laughs> now, what happens is that the three things, uh, that how people live, how people think, and what people value. So, lifestyle, thought systems, and value systems. These three vary from time, place, and circumstance. So if we are to actually understand the past, we need to understand the past in terms of the past, not in terms of the present. I mean, there is this increasing uh, leftist liberal ideology gaining control of the world. They say, we are the most moral generation and everybody in the past was immoral. Why? Because we value equality. You know, we value equality of all kinds. So Abraham Lincoln was the person who actually ended slavery, more or less in America, at legal level. But 
before he did that, for some part of his life, in the early elections, he said, okay, even if you can't end slavery, we should minimize it. And he would treat, at least slaves to be treated humanely. But there are some people in America who said, Abraham Lincoln was a racist and he should be cancelled because he supported slavery. Even if he says human, it's slavery. <laughs> well, okay, if you had been at that time, you would have been a far bigger, worse slave master than what he would have been. <laughs> yeah. So the idea that if we know what is best and we will ev evaluate everything of the past from our perspective, it is, it is an egoistic vision of the past. So of course, so with respect to this past time, the idea is that in the past, the two things have happened. So is, so do we as a movement recommend that parents who discipline their child, children, tie up the children today? <laughs> of course not. So in scripture, there is something which is descriptive and something which is prescriptive. Descriptive is simply describing how things were there at that time. And everything that is descriptive in scripture is not prescriptive. <laughs> it is not that that was done that time, that's why we have to do it this time. Now, nobody is saying that uh, today, because we want to be devotees, so all of us should have our own grinding mortar and we should be churning butter and making it into curd. <laughs> if you can, well and good. But the important thing is, offer whatever food you get to Krishna and then, then take it. So there is descriptive, there is prescriptive. So everything in scripture is not the teaching of scripture. So that's the first point. And second point is that a discipline has been enforced in different ways in different cultures. So two things have happened broadly. First, in some ways, in the past, the past was a more physically challenging world. Many of the comforts that we have right now, they were not there. So people in general were physically tougher. In general, punishments were more physical. The life was more physical. You know, people would have to do farming or even warriors. They didn't need artificial gyms to build their muscles. They had to do physically challenging tasks. So the past was a more physical culture and therefore physical discipline also a part of it. And another more, more important reason why corporeal punishment is, is disapproved nowadays is that while we have become a less physical culture today, simultaneously we have got more dangerous physical weapons. So in the past, even a powerful warrior would not have a weapon like a machine gun. Here, for example, in America, many of you have heard of gun violence. You know that a, a youth cannot buy, buy drugs, of course drugs, a danger is always, but legally, a youth cannot buy drugs till he is 21 because he'll harm himself. But that same youth can buy a machine gun that can kill a hundred people <laughs> legally. So our values are perverted. And what has happened is we have access to far more dangerous objects at the physical level. And that is why what, what happens is this combination of greater outer power and lesser inner power. Greater outer power means we have very dangerous weapons and lesser inner power means we don't have sufficient self-control, we don't have sufficient intelligence to discern what is right and what is wrong. This is a deadly combination. So in that sense, restraining uh, corporeal discipline, uh, physical discipline is a step which is necessary in today's world. But the point is, there in Krishna Leela, when we impose our conceptions, it's, it's not child abuse by any stretch of the world. Now, no mother can love her child as much as Mother Yashoda loves her child. Hmm? Like her love is the pinnacle for which, towards which all mothers can aspire. And it is out of her love that she is trying to discipline her. And when she is disciplining her, actually speaking, it is extraordinary because he is God and he is getting bound. So as we say, that he is Sita Graivam Dhamodara Bhakti Padham. He is bound by love. He is not bound by uh, simply a rope. So it's a it's it's a triumph of love, which is actually which is almost complete opposite of abuse of power. So that's how if we impose our perspectives, our filters, <coughs> carry our filters, we can completely misunderstand what is going on in scripture. And curiously, 
a similarly horrendous misunderstanding can happen with the Vishwarupa also. <coughs> Some of you may know about uh, seven, eight years ago that in Russia, there was an attempt to ban the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the agent, the, many, the group behind it was primarily the ROC. ROC is the Russian Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. So they felt that they were threatened by the way the Hare Krishna was spreading. And one of the reasons they said why they should be banned is that these people worship a cannibalistic god. A god who eats human beings. I say, what craziness. And their justification was in the 11th chapter in the Vishwarupa, in the mouth of Vishwarupa, the various warriors are described as going in. <laughs> and based on that, now actually speaking, at one level the description is very costly. It is described that as these warriors, Katha, Nadinam, Bahuam, Vega, Samudrama, Pravishan. So, Samudra, and that just as rivers are flowing into the ocean, similarly, the warriors are flowing into the mouth of Krishna, the mouth of the Vishwarupa. And similarly, Katha, Pradiptam, Jalanam, Patangaha, two metaphors are given. The other metaphor is just as a moth. Moth entrusts towards fire. Similarly, warriors are entering into the mouth of the Vishwarupa. And then it is described as they are entering into it, it is Churnitai Uttamangai, that their head is getting smashed. And then as the blood is sprinkling all over, Leli Yase Krasamana Samantar, the Vishwarupa is taking out his tongue and licking the blood. It's like, you know, sometimes some children, if they are eating some sweet rice and they don't eat it, so they spread on their mouth. They don't miss even one drop. You know, so they will lick their tongue to get everything delicious. <laughs> so like that. So at one level, this description can seem ghastly. But what is going on over it? For if anybody reads the Bhagavad Gita, it's clear that it's not literal in the sense of what we consider literal. There is no no mention of any deity. What to speak of Krishna, who is Suratanath, who is the god of love, be cannibalistic. Then what is going on? This is a, a, a metaphorical depiction. What is described is that there are multi, multiple ways to understand this. So now, uh, now I would say the first thinking of that is child abuse is a genuine misunderstanding. Hmm? Yeah, somebody may think like that. If they have maybe they, they were abused in childhood, or somebody being abused in childhood, that might uh, trigger some unhappy memories for them, and that's that's understandable misunderstanding. But this is very much of a malicious misunderstanding. <laughs> See, uh, a mal and like, you know, it's not that, it's not that you misunderstand, it's you want others to misunderstand. You understand what you're doing, you want to spread misconception about others. Misconception among others. So what is happening in this particular pastime is, or in the darshan of the Virat Rupa, is Krishna is depicting how ultimately the conception of God is inclusive. If God is really the source of everything, then one reality of the world is also death. And we can't deny the reality of that world. So the conception of divinity includes creation, maintenance and destruction. Just as when creation happens, a new life is born, we understand it's a gift of God, from God. It's arranged by God. And similarly, when there is death, there is destruction. So, now, a body entering into fire, this fiery mouth and which is getting smashed. Now, in our understanding tradition, there is, at the end of life, the body is cremated. Mm. And the body is literally put into fire. So, some people say, it's so, so, uh, it's so brutal. <laughs> You're just burning the body. You don't even honor the body by burying it. Well, actually speaking, we honor the soul within the body by burning the body. So, in the, there are many different religious <laughs> traditions. They they all are meant for raising human consciousness towards God, but they all have different conceptions. So, in the Christian tradition, they talk about the soul. But in many ways, they think that the soul and the body are not different. And that's why they think of resurrection as the literal body being reinstated. Just like Jesus was said to have appeared after his crucifixion. They say all of us will come back in our self-same body. 
Of course, that raises uh, uh, the body that we have. Of course, that raises many questions. The, uh, if somebody dies at the age of 80, will they be eternally at the age of 80 for the rest of their life? <laughs> well, then heaven won't be heavenly for them. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the body at 80 is not what we want lifelong, or eternally, for example. <laughs> so, no, no, you have a youthful body. Well, what if somebody died when they were two? They never had a youthful body. So, which body will they have? <laughs> So that in that tradition, the body is seen as as much a part of a person as a soul. But in our tradition, understanding is that the body is a tool for the person. But when the body is the soul has attachment to the body, and when the body is burnt, then the soul gets a sense of irreversible closure. And okay, there's now this body. I lived in this for a long time. I would like to come back, but I can't come back. It's like if we have lived in the house for maybe 30, 40 years and then maybe somehow we are evicted from the house. So if we still hover around the house hoping that maybe I can come back in this house. But then after we are evicted, say the house is demolished. Okay, then that means I can't come back to the house. Let me find a new house and let me move, move on to that. So basically, uh, cremation is, is kindness to the soul because the soul gets a sense of irreversible closure. An emotional closure which is irreversible and the soul can move on. But for some people who are uninformed from the philosophical perspective, so same body that you cared for, that you hugged, you you, you took so much care of, you're just burning it. What kind of culture is it? That's why we have to see each culture from its perspective. So so at one level, in one sense, when Krishna is showing the Virat Rupa, the fire burning the body and destroying the body, that is just like the Antya Samskar. Hmm? That Antya Samskar is going to happen for everyone. Mm -hmm. And in one sense, in our tradition, Agni is itself a god, a devuta, and Agni is also a representative of the Supreme Lord. Mm -hmm. So we are offering the body to Agni. Devan, the Rigveda says, Devanam Paramo Vishnu, Avamo Agni Tadantara Sarva Devata. That among all the devutas, the highest is Vishnu, and the lowest is Agni. And in between are all the devutas. The lowest here doesn't mean that in the least powerful. Lowest means most accessible. That among all the devutas, the offerings we made to Agni, Agni takes it to other devutas. So that's our understanding. Krishna has also told Arjuna that this war is like a yajna. It's a. He says that yajna ya ajiratah karma samagram praviliyade. Krishna says that you you see this sacrifice, this war and sacrifice. In this sacrifice, what is happening is the the you the sacrificial fire is the Kurukshetra battlefield. You are the priest. Your Gandiva bow and arrow are like the sacrificial spoon. And those who are opposing dharma, they are like the offerings into the fire. So of course, this is not being literal again. It is symbolic that all the work that we do is like a sacrifice. Krishna says everything can be envisioned as sacrifice. So that from that perspective, through this vision of the Vishwarupa, Krishna is showing Arjuna that the sacrifice that he will be making will actually be accepted by the Lord. So, you say, in the mouth of Agni, we put sacrifice like that. In the mouth of Virat Rupa, the warriors are going. That means this is a sacred activity. There are opposers of dharma and protecting dharma means neutralizing them. So, it's not cannibalistic at all. So, both these pastimes can actually be misunderstood if we do not see them from the cult proper cultural and philosophical framework. Then if we move forward, so I was talking to Damodala, where does it end? So Mother Yashoda, she ties, tries to tie Krishna, finally she succeeds in tying Krishna. And then after tying, she goes away. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, Krishna is manifesting his huge form without manifesting the huge form. <laughs> He's manifesting his hugeness in his seemingly childlike form. But he stops at a particular time. And when does he stop it? When Mother Yashoda's mood changes. Her mood initially is, he said, my child, how dare the child be undisciplined like that? I have to discipline. <laughs> she says, like, this child is someone special. I really can't discipline that. What is going on over here? And as her mood changes to appreciation, then Krishna man manifests his uh, omnipotence and becomes like a small child and he gets tired. So again, what is happening is, from so if you consider like a graph, from Madhurya, Aishwarya is manifested. And from Aishwarya, okay, Madhurya comes up. Now, in the in the case of Mother Yashoda, because Krishna does not manifest 
his form explicitly and because their mood is the mood of intimacy in mathur in vrindavan so therefore there is not much of uh, there is no prayers being offered by yashoda to krishna hmm? this is a big difference between the brajavasis and all other devotees all devotees pray to krishna and the brajavasis pray for krishna <laughs> the brajavasis they don't think that krishna is god they think that somehow whenever they see in krishna is something wonderful hmm? the after krishna lives govardhan hill as past time come later but after krishna lives govardhan hill and the brajavasis have wonderful loving reciprocation for 7 days and then they come at that time they so entranced by krishna's beauty and krishna's love they forget everything but after that and there is they also have a logical sense and then then with the logic they come and ask them the maharaj no how could krishna have lifted this over the nail how is it possible because some skeptics ask and if krishna really lifted it so how did krishna find say the center of gravity of gorda if i had lifted in physics exercises I have to put my finger over here exactly in the center of hand. Only then I will balance it. So the other place, it's not going to lift it. I won't let it go. Mm-hmm. But how would Krishna, even if he could lift it, he had the physical prowess to lift it. How did he exactly find the center of gravity to balance? <laughs> so Krishna does not have to find the center of gravity because he is the source of gravity. Maya adhikshena prakriti. that material nature works under his supervision so we accept that there are laws of material nature and those laws are valid and the rajwas some people think in the past people just sentimental sentimental gullible they believed in the stories that were made up it's not like that the rajwas is also rational they ask how could krishna have lifted this they know huge such huge objects can't be lifted but they are open to a broader explanation than what our today's mind or today's uh, educational ethos often allows us that is narantan gargamuni so sorry when nanda maharaj replies that when gargacharya when gargamuni came for the namakaran the name giving ceremony of krishna he told me that krishna is just like narayan is as good as narayan <coughs> So he has so now the Bharat is making the inference. So Gargamuni, the uh, he, uh, he has a very delicate task. Sometimes when we have to speak some things, there is no we don't want to speak a lie, but speaking the truth may jeopardize and endanger other people. So then there is has to be what is called as selective disclosure of truth. <laughs> <laughs> so what gargamuni does is that he when, when they ask him, and he's the he's giving the namakaran so he's also astrologer he has to do he does a horoscope and he tells him so now he doesn't want to tell a outright lie but still he can't say that this is this is this is supreme lord <laughs> so so he's and he also can't really say that so so for first let's say the first one. he says that this child is just like narayan just like narayan and then the question will come up so okay gargacharya is a great acharya why has he come here to do this child use name giving ceremony so he says that we i do it privately so that when comes up not suspect anything but still why would he do it privately also he is the priest of the dynasty of the yadus so just to pacify him he says that actually in the past he was the son of vasudev now this is again a selective disclosure <laughs> so nanda maharaj infers that in the past means in a previous life he was the son of vasudev <laughs> so the vrajivasis they in one sense no and other sense they don't know about krishna's full position so what they think is that he is just like narayan how does anyone become like narayan only narayan is like narayan but if somebody is extremely blessed by narayan 
then that person may be committing a crime. So that in the Indian tradition, it is common that say if a couple is getting married and they are going in a procession, they say, "Oh, they just look like Sitara. They look like Lakshmi Narayan." So now that is both a appreciation and a benediction. That may you develop godly virtues. So the idea is now he thought, then the Maharaj thought that this is being spoken in that mood by Gargachar. <laughs> so he thought that he is specially blessed. And that's why what the Vrajavasis would do is, they would pray for Krishna, all pray for, for Krishna to Narayan. They would pray to Lord Narayan, please keep blessing our Krishna. Please keep protecting him. So whenever Krishna would be in danger, uh, say for example, Krishna was abducted by, was went away with Putana. Putana, she ran away after he was holding on to her breast while drinking milk. And then they didn't know where she had gone or when he was taken away to Navarth. After that, when he would be rescued, the Vrajavasis would chant prayers. They would chant Vishnu mantras for the protection of Krishna. So the Vrajavasis don't pray to Krishna, they pray for Krishna. For Krishna. <laughs> now, occasionally, like in Govardhan Puja, they do pray to Krishna. But it's more circumstantial. Oh, Krishna, you are our, no one is there to protect us, you protect us. They see Krishna as an extraordinary hero, more than as a god who is the object of prayer. So Yashodamai doesn't pray to Krishna, although her appreciation for Krishna increases. On the other hand, Arjuna does pray to Krishna. So this is where, where parallels means also we discuss what is not parallel over here. So Arjuna offers prayers to Krishna from verses 37 to 47 in the 11th chapter. It's the only place in the Gita where Arjuna offers prayers to Krishna. And he starts his prayers by saying, yeah, actually, my dear Lord, where do I offer obeisances? And if we come to a temple and the deities are in front of us, we offer over here. But sometimes if you go to some, some Hindu temples, it's like, it's not a temple, it's like a museum of temples. <laughs> in one sense. That is, there are deities everywhere. So if, if the deities are in all directions, then which direction do we offer obeisances? <laughs> so Arjuna is bewildered like that. So he says, Arjuna, so he says Nama Purusta Tapushta Taste. See, I offer obeisances up front, I offer obeisances up behind. I say, Namo Namaste to Sahas Rakritva Punasya Bhuyo Pi Namo Namaste. So I say, I offer obeisances hundreds of times and I offer obeisances eight again. From front, from back, from all sides. So Arjuna is offering obeisances like that. And then Arjuna says that, oh, Krishna, you know, I'm blessed by seeing this form of yours. And I took you for granted. So as I said, things are a little more subtle in Prajashirila. Outside, Krishna's divinity is more manifested. So Arjuna says, I took you for granted. Sakheti matva prasabham yaduktam. He Krishna he yadavas he sakheti. Ajanata mahimanam davedam maya pranadat pramadat prane navapi. So he says, I just referred to you in a very familiar term. Hey Krishna, hey Sakha, hey Yadava. So, Vishwanchi Thakur explains that, he says, Yadava, he says, that I am the royal prince. Hmm? But you are not the royal prince, you are never going to become king. So you are just one member of the other dynasty. That's Yadava. So he says, it's my grace to you that I, became, I thought that I was gracing you by becoming a friend of yours. But now I understand that you were gracing me. So please forgive me. There is that mood of forgiveness. And then he says, here there is a similarity with the earlier pastime. That Mother Yashoda, she sees Krishna's universal form in her mouth. She's just thinking, what's happening over here? What's happening? She's like, to figure it out, we just can't figure it out. <laughs> so Arjuna also sees this universal form, he's overwhelmed. And then he says, My dear Lord, you have blessed me with this form, I'm grateful. Now please show your two hand. <laughs> hmm? And there, uh, Krishna decides to tease Arjuna. Krishna says, Arjuna, this form is extremely rare. <laughs> so he says, not by study of Vedas, not by exhaustive, uh, uh, not by recitation of the Vedas, not by exhaustive study of scripture, not by great austerity, not by meditation. None of these ways you can see this form. You've got such a rare sight. Why don't you want to see it more? He says, no, 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 I have had enough. <laughs> <laughs> I have had enough, please. So, now, why does he say I have had enough? I mentioned that Prabhupada says in the 11th chapter of Prabhupada that a devotee is not interested in such a godless display of opulence. What that means is, 
If God is displaying his opulence, why would Prabhupada call this as a godless display of opulence? Because yes, it is God displaying his opulence. But this opulence is being displayed in a way that it is very difficult to offer personal love. Hmm? That a devotee wants a personal relationship with the Lord. And this is the key point which points us to Vrindavan. And with this point, I will conclude the past time and the class. That for the devotees, uh, the Aishwarya of the Lord actually enhances the Madhuri of their relationship. A devotee is not interested in the greatness of God simply for the greatness of God. A devotee is interested in the greatness of God because it enhances the sweetness of their loving reciprocations with Krishna. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the, in the Vraja tradition, in the Vrindavan, that Krishna lifted Govardhan is described. But very few people actually, if you study the Acharya's commentary, you know, contemporary teachers, they don't say, oh, Krishna lifted Govardhan, therefore he's God. Just see his Buddha divine. No, he said Krishna lifted Govardhan and an ekadina man Indra Kumaru. He humbled Indra. Or he received great love with his devotees. So for him, Krishna is showing miracles not because he wants to prove that he is God. He wants to further his pastimes. And in that, those pastimes centered on loving reciprocation. So even Krishna's exhibition of his greatness, of his godhood, of his divinity is actually simply to further the reciprocation of love. And this is Krishna. In Damodar Leela, he could, if he is really God, and he is, but he simply wanted to exhibit his Godhood, he is unlimited, he would just sit in his room, he could extend his arm, and his arm can go into the place, the room where the butter is there, he can take the butter, he can eat, it's over, the there is no past in there. But Krishna is not simply interested in eating butter. At one level, Krishna is Om Purna Vada Purna Vidu. Krishna doesn't need any food. He is the provider of food for everyone. What he, what he is hungry for is love. Hmm? Krishna controls everything in the world except one thing. Can you guess what that one thing is? Our false ego. Our false ego? Our free will. Love of devotees. Hmm? Our love of devotees. Krishna, yes, all of them pointing to the right thing. Krishna controls everything in the world except our heart. Our heart is entirely ours for to do what we want to do. We can offer our heart to a cricketer, to a video game hero. We can offer our heart to a Star Wars hero, to a superhero in Marvel comics or whatever. We can offer our heart to a politician. We can offer a heart to so many things in the world. We, that is up to us. But Krishna longs and thirsts and hungers for our heart's love. And for him, everything in the material world and everything in the spiritual world is arranged by, is an arrangement by which a person is prompted to offer their heart to Krishna and then Krishna offers his heart back in reciprocation. That is the sweetness of the reciprocation of love. So even when Krishna manifests his divinity, in Vrajalila, what we describe is Krishna lifted Govardhan, but that's just described in a few verses, and after that, if you consider Anand, Lavan, Champu, other books, then the description is how Krishna and the Vrajavasa, that sweet loving reciprocations under Govardhan. You know, what he did, how he spoke with Ishoda, how he spoke with the Sakhas, how we Radharani came, how we reciprocated with her. All those things are described, and that's the key part of the world that we love for our Acharyas. Because it's the reciprocation of love that is important. Similarly, when Krishna manifests his divinity, it is not that some people say that actually Krishna, when he spoke the Bhagavad Gita, he couldn't pursue Arjuna by his logical reasoning. And that's why he showed his divinity. And that's what scared Arjuna and forced him into compliance. <laughs> well, that's a complete misreading of the Gita. Because before, this is the 11th chapter, and the 10th chapter itself, Krishna speaks the Chatushloka Gita, which at one level concludes the Gita. And that line itself in 10, 12, 13, uh, 14, that sequence of verses, Arjuna says, 
परम ब्रह्म परम धाम पवित्रम परम भगवान यू आर द सुप्रीम रियालिटी एंड सर्व मेतम मन्य मदसिकेश सो कृष्णा डिड नॉट रिलाय ऑन इज गॉडहुड टू परसुड अर्जुन कृष्णा एंड वॉन्टेड टू डू दैट Krishna would have finished the whole Gita in six words. <laughs> I am God. Obey me. Fight. Bhagavad Gita over. <laughs> That was not Krishna's mood. Krishna persuaded Arjuna, and he used reasoning and philosophy to persuade Arjuna. Arjuna was persuaded, and when Krishna showed the Virat Rupa, it was because Arjuna requested it, and Arjuna requested it. because arjuna wanted the world to know that what krishna is saying is not just bragging krishna can back his words with actions and krishna said that he sustains the whole universe and krishna can give a vision which shows that also now having said that now arjuna is also taken aback by the magnitude of the vision see sometimes we may ask god to display something or to show some promise and anybody who asks krishna to show show some power you know they end up getting some getting more than what they bargained <laughs> is it we have lord shiva asking uh, asking the lord for what mohini showing mohini mood <laughs> and what happens is he himself become mohit by that now that's of course a tragic past but that's what happened we have markandeya rishi asking the lord what to show his show your maya shakti and then he doesn't just the lord doesn't show the maya shakti markandeya rishi becomes a part of the show itself <laughs> is it he is seen going here and there what's happening but through it all the, at, at the end of it lord shiva praises praises and glorifies which no one could have deluded me only you could have deluded me so what is it even that exhibition of maya and the delusion resulting from that is also a reciprocation of love between the lord and the devotee Markandeya Rishi's devotion also gets enhanced. So Arjuna, for him also, what happens is at the end of the past time, or at the end of the eleventh chapter, Arjuna's mind becomes pacified, but also he becomes his heart becomes more convinced, more dedicated. Arjuna has accepted that in principle, but in 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 sensory perception, when we see something, there is a greater con greater conviction that comes from. so although we say shabda is the ultimate praman we accept shastra as the ultimate authority at the same time in sanatan goswami is brihat bhagavata amrita it is described that anubhav is the highest praman from a individual perspective that means when we get experience of something the conviction coming from that is unparalleled so the idea is Yes, in principle, we accept shabda is the highest. The shabda is the source of all authority. Like say, if somebody is a good doctor, mm -hmm. now we have heard from many people that that person is a good doctor. We have heard that that person has been educated in a very great, very good, good college. That that person has been practicing for a long time. So we may have faith, and this person is studying these books, so we have faith. It's good to have that faith. But when we are ourselves cured by that doctor, then if somebody says, "Oh, this doctor is a quack," you know. You are a quack. You are accusing me. I am cured of this. So similarly, for us, we may study shastra, and by studying shastra, we may get faith. We have faith in shastra. So what shastra teaches also, we have faith in it. At the same time, when we experience ourselves, that level of conviction goes much deeper. So Arjuna has accepted what Krishna has said in the tenth chapter itself, but when Krishna demonstrates that. the conviction goes much deeper and that is why as devotees we study scripture but at the same time we also seek spiritual experiences when we have when we have festivals when we have kirtans when we have katha and all these are opportunities for us to not just gain an explanation of krishna but gain the experience of krishna when you get experience of krishna that is like the ultimate ct confirmatory test for a devotee Krishna is real. Krishna really cares for me. Remembering Krishna can really raise my consciousness to a higher level. So that's how Arjuna's mind become completely pacified. And then after whatever question Arjuna asks, he answers the miscellaneous questions to clarify various concepts. 
But thereafter, Arjuna is completely convinced to do Krishna's will. And that line is reciprocal history toward the end of the Gita, where Arjuna says, Karishye Vachanam, I will do your will. Now, interestingly, in Damodar Leela, the ending happens slightly later. See, the 11th chapter more or less dynamic over, then there are 6 chapters that go on. And then 18th chapter, there is the end, where Krishna calls for surrender, Arjuna surrenders in love. And the two are united hmm, in their action thereafter. But in this case, what happens is, so there is, I said, from Madhurya to Aishwarya, then back to Madhurya. But here, the Madhurya is not manifested so quickly. So Krishna again becomes in a form which he is tied up, tieable. But even after that, he is tied and Mother Yashoda has gone away. And Krishna brings the Yamalajan trees down. He releases Nalakovar and Manipurinu. And thereafter, what happens? He is still lying over there. You know, he is. He has liberated those who have been bound in material existence, but he still remains bound. <laughs> he still remains bound, and then everybody is aghast. What happened? These trees fell down. Is it Krishna okay? <laughs> and Nanda Maharaj is just returning at that time from outside. Nanda Maharaj runs and he, sees, he picks up Krishna. He asks other people what happened, and they say that Ishwara had tied him up and. Uh, at that time, you know, Krishna pulled the granny motor and pulled it down. And the Maharaj doesn't know what to be, what not to be. <laughs> See, at least he's happy Krishna is safe. And then Krishna is holding one and the Maharaj tightly. And then they come back home. And Krishna says to the Maharaj, Ishwada might tied me up, I will never go back to her again. And then the Prajwasi tells the story very nice. He says that Krishna then then the Maharaj is trying to remind Krishna, remind Krishna of all the love that Mother Ishwara has for him. says, Krishna, and who will feed you? Will you, Baba. <laughs> <laughs> who will bathe you? You, Baba. <laughs> who will dress you? You, Baba. <laughs> so, now what is happening is that the Maharaj has come back to the home, Ishwara is in the inner chambers. And Ishwara is hearing all this. And her heart is breaking to hear that Krishna doesn't want to be with her. And Krishna is angry, Krishna is defiant. And the Maharaj is trying to pacify him. Then Nishdama is speaking through the window and looking at Krishna. Krishna is not even ready to look at her. When the Maharaj is looking at her, he says, what should I do? So, at that time, as Krishna appears to be very hard, so this is something similar to what Arjuna, Krishna is saying, Hey, you see this form, this is glorious. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Krishna is extending, Krishna is increasing. Here Krishna may seem to be hard-hearted. But actually Krishna is not being hard-hearted. Krishna is, by creating separation, He is intensifying the longing with Nishoda's heart. And when there will be union, there will be even greater joy. Then finally, and nothing that Nanda Maharaj says works. Nanda Maharaj himself feeds Krishna. And Krishna is, after he is now, he is well fed, he is a little peaceful. And then Rohini comes there. And Rohini says, Krishna. And Krishna looks at Rohini and Rohini looks very, very distressed, very modified, very aghast. He looks at her, what happened? And he says that, no, Krishna, without you, Yashoda Mai can't live. She is refusing to eat any food. She will die if you are not with her. And as soon as Krishna hears this, Ishadamai will die. Krishna jumps off the lap of him, the Maharaj, and runs to Ishadamai. And they want to rejoin a delightful, delighted embrace of love. And thus, there is the culmination of this past time. Ishadamai and then are reunited once again. And that is how the pastime, ultimately love, it doesn't just mean that two people come together. But love means that two people keep coming together with a deeper bond. So through the Bhagavad Gita's dynamics, what does Krishna and Arjuna come closer to each other? So the Dhammadalla pastime, not only is the love between Ishwada and Krishna expressed, but the love between them is also developed, it's enriched. That enrichment is manifested both in the culmination of the Bhagavad Gita 
and the culmination of the Dhammada Leela. So we can also pray that by hearing these pastimes, by hearing the subtle undercurrents of the emotional dynamics in all this, that we may also experience and enrich our devotion for the Lord. So I quickly summarize. I discussed the second part of the parallel between Dhammada Leela and Krishna Leela and Krishna's Bhagavad Gita message. So I talk about three main things. First is how bringing our filters over there can lead to misunderstanding. Shudama is dying, Krishna is not child abuse and Krishna, the universal form, having warriors entered into it, entering into the mouth is not cannibalism. So we need to understand cultures of the past from their perspective, from their, from understanding how they live, how they thought and what they valued. From that framework we adopt and can understand. Everything in scripture is not teaching of scripture, it's descriptive and it's prescriptive. Then the second part I discussed is, and how the Brajavasis don't pray to Krishna, they pray for Krishna. And when Krishna has manifested his divinity, his greatness, and he's come back to the normal form, for Vishuddhamma is able to tie Krishna, and Arjuna, after offering prayers and seeking forgiveness, has Krishna come back to the normal form, a two-handed form. And then finally, uh, it is that Krishna and Arjuna, they unite in their determination to work together to establish dharma. And Krishna, uh, you, the, uni the revelation of the universal form leads to a deeper conviction in Arjuna. We may philosophically understand, and the Shabda is the highest Praman in general, but personally, Anubhav is the highest Praman. So for Yashodamaya also, she always loves Krishna, but through this whole Leela where she fails to tie Krishna, ties, catches Krishna and ties Krishna, and then is rejected by Krishna and then is reunited with Krishna, her love for him becomes deeper. So, this is a past time which express love and enrich love. Thank you very much. Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? So, um, as you mentioned about the filters, like, thank you for first, thank you for the class. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. um, like, we, you know, by education or experience, or pre we have so many filters. When you come in mm -hmm. Bhakti, we, like, for example, reading Bhagavad Gita or Approaching devotees or duty that filters there. So, like it says, I'm asking how to filter the filters. <laughs> <laughs> like, because it is sometimes we approach them that way, later we really like that's not the thing. Yeah. So, how do we filter the filters? <sighs> there are two ways. One is that if we just expose ourselves to Krishna. The potential Krishna Bhakti itself will remove all misconceptions. Krishna Surya Sama Maya Yandaka. So we don't have to, like there's Freudian psychoanalysis where people go into, oh, this happened to me in my childhood, this happened to me there, this happened to me there. So, so and uh, well, when Prabhupada was asked, he says, we all have had shocks in our childhood which affected us. Prabhupada is not only childhood, adult, throughout your life you have shocks. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's not meant to trivialize. The point is that, there is no need for us to consciously go into our past and keep analyzing. Mm. Life is not meant to be spent in doing post-mortems. Mm. So in general, just the practice of Krishna Bhakti will cleanse us. Mm. Just keep exposing ourselves to Krishna and Krishna Bhakti, misconception will go away. However, there may be some misconceptions or preconceptions that may impede our exposure to Krishna itself. That means, say for example, if somebody has a, uh, been abused as a child and when they see Dhammutar Leela, if that is triggering some negative memories, then they need to get that addressed. So we can look at ourselves, at our own experience of Krishna Bhakti and see if certain stimuli within Krishna Bhakti are either emotionally or intellectually triggering negative reactions within us. So uh, not everything may trigger positive reactions right now. Because we may not have the devotion by which you experience Krishna through all those things. But if they are triggering negative reactions, then that's the time we need to, we, we can become aware. Yeah, this is something which is a filter. Mm. Krishna is the supreme positivity ultimately. Mm. So, then we can explore, okay, what could be causing this? And even then, sometimes we can get to the cause in terms of going backward to understand the source which has triggered it. But sometimes we may not be able to. 
um, history is quite, uh, even our own personal history is quite complex. We may not remember much of it. We may misremember some of it. So it's better to, rather than going too much into the source and backwards, you can focus on changing the effect at present. Okay, whatever it is, it's not a negative thing. Just get the positive understanding of whatever seems to be bothering us. And once you get the positive understanding, then we will start experiencing Krishna positively through that situation also. Okay. That stimuli also. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Anaji. Uh, why, thank you for coming uh, While uh, listening all this Leela, especially Ramadan Leela and all, in, any time whenever we hear that Leela, Chayam Leela of the Lord, that time naturally the Vatsalyam how it's coming. Uh, so, is that a sahij? Some people say no. You shouldn't, shouldn't think that way because otherwise you are going to sahij jab. So he is the Lord. So always remember he is the Lord. But why we are listening on the yeah, okay. yes. So is it that if we start feeling vatsalya bhav after hearing Krishna's childhood pastimes, is that being sahajiya sentimental? No, not necessarily. Ultimately, devotion is an emotion. And yena kena prakarina mana krishna So somehow or the other, we remember Krishna. And even if we experience some emotion in relationship with Krishna, such as remembrance is not just a cognitive or intellectual, remembrance is also in terms of emotions. So if any way we remember Krishna, that is good. And if you feel an emotional connect with Krishna in any way, that is also good. So when does it become Sahajiya? When that emotion starts obstructing our philosophical understanding. See, we remember Krishna as God and we worship him as God. So for example, if somebody starts feeling what's the of Krishna, that's good, very good. But they start saying, you know, okay, Krishna is like my child. So, you know, when I'm offering bhoga, if my child, I can eat the food and give it to my child also afterwards, <laughs> like that. I can give my Judah to my child, so I can give my Judah to Krishna also. No. That, if the there's certain discipline, there's certain standards of purity that are followed in the worship of Krishna. So if our Vatsali Bhava starts, starts disrupting our following of the rules of Sadhana Bhakti, that is when it is pratikul, as unfavorable, and that's when it is considered to be Utpata Yaiva Kalpate. It is said that it, it has created disruption in society, disruption in our hearts, of course. So otherwise, it's wonderful if you experience any emotion in the relationship with Krishna. You can see that as a treasure, a blessing, and relish and cherish it. Okay. Okay. Yes, Share some of your experience with Krishna or of Krishna. Some of my experience with Krishna. I am still struggling, struggling sadhaka. I can't say that I have any experiences of Krishna directly. But for all of us, Krishna manifests in particular ways. So Krishna will manifest through Kirtan through someone. Krishna will manifest as a deity to someone. For example, that means somebody experiences something extraordinary while Kirtan is going on. Somebody experiences something special while they are in worship of the deities. So I am, and many times this also depends on our past culture, our nature. So Krishna manifests through particular channels for us. So for me, uh, I am more of a verbal person. Mm -hmm. So for me, I experience the world through words. I experience Krishna also primarily through words. So there are, there have been several times when mm, I was, at one time I had a very painful fracture. I'd fallen down and had a fracture. And the pain was unbearable. And other place where there was no doctor, no pain medication available. So as to, at the time, I was just trying to chant, I just couldn't focus. I started writing, reciting Bhagavad Gita verses, and it's amazing. I felt as if the Bhagavad Gita verses just lifted me above my physical situation. Mm -hmm. I just kept reciting, reciting, reciting. And finally, when I was went to, I was rushed to an ambulance to a doctor, and he says, we went to X-ray to do the X-ray. I mean, it's a very serious fracture. He said, you have to go to the hospital immediately. I went to the hospital, and the doctor said, what's wrong? He said, I have a fracture. Okay, let's do an X-ray. He said, no, we are done the X-ray. And he said, who's X-ray? He says, 
you know, a person with this kind of scratch will be screaming in pain. They fall unconscious by now. So now, I'm not saying that I am transcendental. I'm just saying that at that time I experienced, there are many other times when a small pain also irritates me. So you could say that that lifting of potency is not due to my advanced it is due to Krishna's mercy. So we can't, it's not that we can demand transcendence on call. The Krishna, I want to become transcendental now. It doesn't work like that. But sometimes you get that experience. We all have this experience that in some situations, we may just broken down in the past. But somehow after the practice of Krishna Bhakti, we are able to face that situation without so much agitation, so much stuff. That indicates we are experiencing Krishna. So in general, the experience of Krishna for us, so that's the, so like the true the verses of the Gita, through words primarily. I like to write. I feel writing is the time when I get the closest to immersion in Krishna completely. When I would write nicely, I just forget the entire world. It's words. Sanskrit words, uh, English words used for glorifying Krishna. So we all have to find that channel by which we experience Krishna. And uh, essentially, uh, so rather than focusing on one person's experiences, you know, we can we can try to find out, okay, how does this experience, what does it mean for me? How can I experience? So the idea is that we are all spiritually asleep. Right? We wake up sometimes briefly, but we all fall asleep. But even say, say baby is asleep and when babies are newborn, they don't understand anything. They don't even, they may be suckling their mother's breasts and getting milk, but they may not even understand that this is actually a mother. It's something, something is coming nice and this feels nice and I take it. But as they grow up, they start understanding, oh, this is a person, this is a mother and she cares for me, she loves me. So imagine a baby is sleeping, it's, it's very cold and she's feeling cold and that time she starts shivering. And then the mother sees the shivri, the mother puts a nice thick comfort on the baby. Now, the baby's eyes are still closed. The baby's almost asleep. But still, when she feels the warmth, hmm, just by feeling the warmth, she understands that my mother is here. My mother must have put something on me and that's why I'm feeling comfortable. So similarly for us, you know, we are still spiritually asleep. So we can't pursue Krishna directly. Some of us may be blessed and may have Krishna in a dream, may have some darshan of Krishna, but that's rare. But what happens is, when we are facing distress, we try to remember Krishna and we may find that suddenly, just the anxiety, the tension, the fear, the insecurity, the negativity, it just disappears. It's like all the cold has gone away. It's as if somebody has put a comfort on us. So when we start experiencing that, that we can understand Krishna is here and Krishna is offering this comfort, this shelter. So those are the ways. So when we when we are able to transcend or when the world's experiences don't define our experience. From the worldly perspective, we should be in pain, we should be angry, we should be we should be shattered. But if the world's experiences don't define our experience then that means we are experiencing something higher. And we can infer that is the that is our experience of Krishna. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Prabhuji, you said in front of you, tell us how the Bhagavad Gita oh, okay. is conceived and then also revealed. Okay. So thank you. So I was talking, thank you for reminding me. So that yesterday at the start I had mentioned that, that, that in the Bhagavad Gita also, the Dhamodar Leela is both concealed and revealed. So now, specifically the Dhamodar Leela, now what, what is the Dhamodar Leela? Because the Dhamodar Leela is basically Krishna getting tired, Krishna breaking down a tree. So are there any explicit references to this? Well, not explicit. That's why in that sense it's, it's not there, it's concealed. But there are many references uh, where it's just allusions. Allusions means it's an implicit reference. Say for example, now I'm staying at your place. Say if he has shared a private joke, in which maybe I, the word fears had come out. So now, I may use the word fears in the class and I may just glance at you. And I may smile, you may also smile. So what happens is, 
everybody else they were, what's going on fears is just a word but for you and me because we share some experience centered on that word there is an implicit connection is there so that's an illusion so like that there are allusions to vrajalila so for example sarva dharman pratyaja maam ekam sharanam vraja now vraja literally means to move so vraja is a land of motion vrajati kim in the second chapter vraja asks kim asit vrajeta kim how do self realized people sit how do self realized people walk so literally krishna is saying that you surrender to me and go and act in the world fight that's the point but vraja also refers to vrinda and krishna knows it arjuna knows it so because both of them know it so it's an illusion that is referring to vraja and similarly krishna uses the word damodar mm -hmm. arjuna also in one of his prayers uses the word damodar so when he uses the word damodar so for example when he is describing the virat rupa sarvam samapno shitato si sarva that you pervade everything therefore you are everything and yet arjuna is expressing wonder that you is the wonder of krishna is that the universe is contained within krishna and yet krishna is contained within the universe is it that krishna that is within the universe there is one one planet earth or that one planet there is one place kurukshetra on kurukshetra there is one chariot and the chariot in one part krishna is there so the person who contains the universe is contained within the universe so how is that possible so just as the damodar that rope contained uh, that rope constrained or contained arjuna contained krishna although krishna contains the whole universe so like that he is saying that on my chariot in the chariot in his position you are sitting o krishna and you are you contain everything but still you are sitting in that small seat now it's not that the chariot is seat is like raj sinhasan <laughs> the chariot is seat is a functional seat chariot has to sit it's a small austere seat in one sense but krishna you are sitting there so that so the references to damodar in the bhagavad gita are where there is like a hint at the damodar lila and especially in the context of the virat rupa that hint becomes even clearer there are different descriptions in the mahabharat that arjuna has heard krishna's past times there are not many references to krishna's childhood past times but they are there where arjuna is aware of krishna's childhood past times and krishna arjuna also speaks about them sometimes mentions them briefly so that's the pointing of where it is revealed okay. thank you shri damodar lila ki shri bhagavad gita ki shri krishna bhagwan ki shri prabhu pad ki gaur bhakta vrind ki jai gaur bhakta vrind ki